co-founder of uh, 2050 Wealth Partners, some of my favorite people in the business and some of our most influential financial advisors. Give them a hand. Welcome to the stage. Thanks for being here. I'm going to get my chair. Oh, my goodness. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I moved that one. Inviting okay. myself up here. Unannounced game of musical chair. Thanks very much uh, for introducing us. It was a great session beforehand. Um, there was a, uh, a lot of interesting discussion about the markets. And uh, a nice segue into our conversation here about investing uh, for retirement, the new rules of investing for retirement. Uh, you know, investing for retirement in retirement uh, is when the rubber really hits, hits the road. And especially as you get closer and in retirement, which is where I think we'll focus uh, most of our discussion today, um, the pressure is really on. Um, um, it can be a very stressful time for folks. Um, they're transitioning from a paycheck, knowing that every week, twice a month, there, you're, you've got money coming in uh, to some degree. And all of a sudden, you know, at the very least, uh, uh, maybe those paychecks are a little less frequent. They're not as big. Uh, they might be stopping altogether. And you have to live off that money that you've saved for all those years. Um, and you know, for, for many folks, um, um, it, it can be a very uh, emotionally difficult time, as they, there's a lot of fear about Am I going to make this money last? You know, what happens if I can't make this money last? And people need a lot of help with this. It's, it's a complicated uh, calculus going from that uh, money coming in uh, from your employer, from your business, to having to manage essentially paying yourself and making that money last 20, 30 years uh, with all the complications that come with it, especially uh, health issues as we age. Um, supporting families, um, your, your kids who suddenly come to you needing money. Uh, there's a lot of variables here. Uh, so I'm excited to talk about this and talk about some of the, some of the, the old rules and new rules, uh, what rules apply, uh, where things have changed, and uh, where they haven't, because some, some things are still true. Um, uh, Christine, I know you just got off the last panel, but so we're going we're gonna to dig right in and just throw it right back at you here. So one of the biggest questions that people have when they get to retirement is, OK, how much money can I withdraw from my nest egg? How much can I uh, pay myself uh, as time goes on? And this is, this is the scary part, right? If I take too much, um, am I going to run out of money? Um, if I take too little, am I you know, you know, having to make choices I don't really want to make? I don't get to enjoy life. Um, and of course, you know, one of the biggest rules of thumb around uh, retirement and withdrawal rates is the 4% rule, uh, which has sort of become just like the rule of thumb, most gospel you can find it anywhere on the internet. Um, you and, and uh, other folks at Morningstar have done a lot of research into this. So first, um, why don't we talk a little bit about how the 4% rule uh, works on the surface level and then if we could dig into some of the variables that, that you've been looking at. Sure. Uh, just a little bit of stage setting because there's so much confusion about what 4% means, what the 4% guideline means. It's a rule of thumb that came out of some research that William Bangin, a financial planner, did in the late 1990s, where his idea was, let's look at what would have been the highest that someone could have taken out of their portfolio in year one, and then inflation adjusted that dollar amount thereafter. So even if they met Armageddon in the early years of their retirement, that they would still be OK. So he homed in on this 4% that you could take 4% initially. So if you have a million dollar portfolio, that's $40,000. Then you just give yourself a little bit of an inflation adjustment each, th each year that thereafter. So it's a decent rule of thumb. I, I think about sometimes Fidelity did this research where they asked people who are not steeped in retirement planning how much they could safely take out of their portfolio 
areas and came back with numbers like 10%. So 4% is definitely better than nothing. It's rooted in some empirical research. A couple of big issues with guidelines like that is that most people do not just take a steady amount of, out of their portfolios annually, that there's a lot of research that shows that actually retirement spending trends down in sort of the middle to later years of retirement before sometimes trending back up later on, uh, in part because of uninsured long-term care costs. So it doesn't necessarily sync up with the reality of how people yeah. spend. And then another important issue is that it's not in any way tethered to how the portfolio behaves. So if you're just taking out that $40,000 inflation adjusted, you're not paying attention to what's going on in the portfolio. Subsequent research points to the value of paying attention to what's going on in the portfolio when setting your withdrawal rate and being a little bit variable if you can in terms of those withdrawals. Yeah. So I want to come back to some of the details of the research that you looked at. Um, Lizetta, when we were talking about this, um, um, you, you had the idea that, you know, um, one of the problems with uh, these kinds of rules is that, you know, life isn't customized or uh, life is customized, right? So um, can you just talk a little bit about your experience around uh, handling uh, withdrawal rates and, you know, the 4% rule? I certainly appreciate having guidelines, right? That is a great starting point. And this is what Christina was saying about there was a client that had a 10% and it worked out very well for them. So as a financial planner, our idea is really to say, how much do you need before asking the question, how much should I take out? Um, starting with what you need is really looking at that lifestyle plan. So we're yeah. wondering what expenses are you taking into retirement? Because obviously the income is going to change. That going from a W-2 to several 1099s, whether it's Social Security or um, having the distributions from your retirement accounts or from your brokerage accounts, et cetera, is really figuring out what number we need to work with and to see if that's going to be sustainable as a percentage of your portfolio over at least three decades yeah. as well. So really like having guidelines because it's a starting point. People are often saying, I I don't know what to do or where to begin. It's a good starting point, but definitely not the end point. Right. And, and that uh, the, your, your structure of your life will change as you age, right? I mean, people, um, you know, as they age, maybe they're, they're traveling less. So um, you might be uh, front loading, thinking, oh, I'm going to do, you know, spending for travel um, when I'm, you know, closer to retirement than 20, 20 years in. Um, are, there, are there variables like that that, that, you, that you come across? I would say for our clients, we're thinking about housing, mm -hmm. right? We're thinking about medical expenses, and we're also thinking about long-term care. Yeah. Those are the big three, and everything else is just kind of things that you're, you're able to do. So if you um, have paid off your home, or if you've not, then we have to look at what percentage <laughs> of those line items that I just mentioned to you are taking up the, the majority of your, your income. Obviously, a lot of people would love to travel more because they have more time, yeah. right? Time is a beautiful currency, but time is a beautiful currency when you're healthy, right? And so as we think about different stages, uh, for most people, thank goodness, the long-term care is a play that comes in in decade two or three, which means there are some really strong years where you're feeling good and you're spending. You can't be spending a lot of money uh, where you have to be mindful of that because you got to make it stretch to those years where, yeah, maybe you can't travel as much, but your health is consuming a lot of your resources. Yeah. Um, Christine, we'll come back to you now for some of the, the details of, of the research that, uh, that uh, we've done at Morningstar in terms of um, the, the details of, of what actually does work. Um, so if, if 4% is just a, a good starting point um, for folks who are you know, heading towards that, that age, uh, uh, that, that time of life where they're going to be retiring, um, what are some of the other variables and what are some of the other ways to, uh, to, to, to 
to adjust that 4% rule uh, depending on circumstances? Yeah, there are all kinds of variable strategies. In fact, the research has come back very much in favor of be dynamic, be variable if you possibly can. And there are all different flavors of variable withdrawal strategies. We investigated several of them in our research paper that we put out last year, and we'll be revisiting that research later this year. But one strategy that we really liked from the standpoint of helping the retiree not be buffeted around by what's going on in the portfolio and the portfolio value is called the guardrail strategy. It was developed by Jonathan Guyton, who's a financial planner and researcher as well as William Klinger. And the basic idea is that it does encourage the retiree in a bad year like 2022 to take less from the portfolio, but in good years, the retiree can take more, can give him or herself a little bit of a raise in those good years. So that's a strategy that we found does a good job of helping enlarge in retirement distributions over the retiree's lifetime, but also keeps that retiree from being buffeted around, where suddenly, you know, in a year like 2022 with a super variable strategy, someone might say, well, my goodness, I can't take that trip or I can't go out to dinner. Guardrails tries to protect the retiree standard of living. There are trade offs with these variable strategies, and I could go way in the weeds on this, and I will resist, but one of the big trade-offs in addition to that variability in terms of your cash flow is that you will tend to consume more of your portfolio over your lifetime because you're getting those raises in good markets. That leaves less left over at the end of your life for heirs or charities. You are getting encouragement to spend more on an ongoing basis. So for people who are very conscious of wanting to leave that legacy, a guardrail type strategy or any sort of variable dynamic strategy will tend to be a little less appropriate. Got it. Great. And we'll come back to the uh, the idea of the uh, uh, having some legacy uh, a little bit later on. Um, so that's a nice segue to go a little bit back to what you guys were talking about in the first panel uh, in terms of the uh, the markets and the impact, and um, this was alluded to at the very beginning of the, of the panel discussion. But you know, another another old rule of retirement is is uh, of retirement investing is that sixty forty portfolio split. Um, this has definitely been an unusual year where you guys were addressing it, um, uh, Michael. We were talking a little bit about this before. Um, you know, when you look at the 60, 60 40 uh, portfolio, uh, how's it been doing? Not good. Not great, Bob. <laughs> yeah. Um, so investors have been conditioned over the years that it's stocks for growth and it's bonds to preserve your money. And it's been a rough year. Pre uh, previous to this year, believe it or not, the worst year for just a broad index of bonds was negative 3%, which is shocking. Negative 3% was the worst year that bond investors have ever seen. And so the implied contract that investors make with bonds is that they're not going to experience much volatility. And that's what stocks are for. And so they understand with the stocks that they're volatile and that they're sensitive to the economy and that they're going to get swings. And that's why they take the risk. Like they, they, they get it. And so when they have that risk show up in their bonds, it's jarring. And so I mentioned that the worst year for, for bonds is negative 3%. This year, bonds are down 14%. And so bonds were supposed to be the buffer to offset some of the declines in the stock market historically. And you could easily make the case that this year, not only have bonds not helped with the downside, but they've actually been part of the reason for the downside. And so part of the reason for that is obviously inflation and rising interest rates. And so it's been a really challenging year. But I would point to the fact that unless you just began investing this year, and obviously people in retirement did not start investing in 2022, they've been treated very, very kindly by the markets. Um, not just not just the stock market, but bonds have done very well. So even though the the sixty forty portfolio is um, on pace for its worst year, like by a lot in almost a century, if you zoom out a little bit, uh, the 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 three year returns are ridiculous. The five year and the ten year have been really phenomenal. So even though this year has been lousy. You know, sometimes risk rears its head, and that's what's happened in 2022. Yeah, this is definitely the the outlier case um, by by significant margin, uh, probably much wider than any of us thought we would ever ever see. Um, you know, so the 60 40 por portfolio traditionally um, is a very U.S. focused benchmark. Um, again, first panel, a little bit of discussion of international investing. Um, 
this actually came up in a conversation in the office where, where um, it, it's, it's such an outdated idea that you only have a US-focused portfolio. Um, but it does raise that question of, of allocating your money in retirement um, um, as you know, adding in perhaps even more international uh, investments on the equity side, at least. Um, Christine, we talked a little bit about this. Um, and what's your thoughts here? I like the idea of investors using the global market cap as a benchmark, a starting point for deciding how much to invest uh, overseas. But one important point to make is that U.S. companies have plenty riding on non-U.S. markets, right, the big U.S. companies. So you probably don't need to go entirely with an allocation to non-U.S. stocks in line with the global market capitalization. You could take it a little bit lower because you also get currency fluctuations in the mix, which you may not want when you're in active drawdown mode, or you might want a little less of that currency-related volatility that you inherently get with uh, foreign stock investments. So I would say for retirees, people getting close to drawdown, thinking of uh, non-U.S. allocation in the neighborhood of 25% of the portfolio seems, seems like a reasonable place to start. Another way to uh, uh, another way to look at this is adding in some additional asset classes, and um, Doug, I want to bring you in, into this here. So, um, um, in in the conversations ahead of this panel, we talked about. Um, I was thinking about how to describe this as alternative alternative assets, right? So, uh, tr for a long time in the investment industry, when people said al alternative assets, uh, they were talking about hedge funds, private equity. Um, we had, uh, you know, liquid alt funds. Uh, Morningstar has had a, a long-held view that uh, liquid alt funds, in particular, have been uh, long on hype, short on uh, delivering. Um, you know, but we were talking about uh, moving out in, a, in another direction. And uh, you know, spoiler alert: I'm going to be a little bit skeptical here. Um, but I want to hear uh, your. Let's bring your thoughts into this. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, what one thing I'm noticing, and I, I cater mostly to your. To your geriatric millennials, your your folks knocking forty, if you will, and have a couple kids. Um, and what I'm seeing a lot more of is exposure to this broad umbrella that we're defining as alternative investments. And now we have crypto in there. We have collectibles throughout the road. You can invest in fractionalized um, masterpieces of art. Um, you know, flagship buildings in Manhattan. This is th these are things you never would have had access to uh, in the past unless you got the technology lift that we have today to to create these platforms, as well as just access to traditional uh, financial markets and fractionalized investing on stocks and things like that. So it's it's hard for me not to think forward into which we'll live in a world where the sixty forty or eighty twenty or any risk adjusted model you're thinking of. You know, and you already see this with like um, endowments, Yale particularly, it was such a significant portion in the alternative space. That's because they have access and the capital to get in there. And that level, that, that playing field is being leveled. So for me, in the perspective of dealing with your 30, late 30 something year olds, early 40 something year olds, with a lot of time on their side, it's right in front of me. I see it every day, this gravitation towards greater exposure to what we're calling alts. And by the way, even, even real estate manages to find its way into the alternative umbrella. If it's not stocks, it's not bonds, it's an alternative. And uh, there's just more dollars being allocated there. Um, and I believe the stat is it's, it's doubled over the last seven years or in a sh even a little bit shorter period of time in terms of the exposure of all global assets to the alternative space. So it's hard to buck the trend, just follow the money. Um, it's certainly something that, that we're going to see more of and something I already see a lot more of today relative to just five years ago. But as you mentioned, um, um, if, you're in your, if, if you're in your 40s or 50s, even like, you know, like myself, um, there's, still time on, 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 there's still time on our side. Mm -hmm. um, for uh, more untested type investments. Um, and as you get closer to retirement and in retirement, uh, there's less room for a mistake. Um, and you know, so when you look at these kinds of investments that you're talking about, um, 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 what will it take to adapt them to, uh, to, the, to investors who need more uh, surety in, in you know, maybe not returns, sure. but even just that these things are gonna be around. Right. In 10 or 20. So I think there's two things here, right? There's creation of new asset classes. You're seeing that in the digital asset space and the access to 
alternatives that have been around forever, right? Um, you could always buy a Picasso if you had the money to do so. Fine art's been around for hundreds and hundreds of years versus Ethereum or Bitcoin, which you know has maybe at most a five to 10 year lifespan thus far. And it's very difficult to convince a retiree who's in their 60s or 70s that you know they need to have even at so much of a 5% allocation to digital space money that they don't understand how that necessarily works on the blockchain. You've lost them right there. So that's not going to be something you're necessarily bringing to them. Although, don't be surprised when they're bringing that information to you. Because I see that all the time. And I think a lot of people would be blown away by the number of retirees I do work with that have exposure. One way, whether it's a hundred bucks or ten thousand um, bucks, that has also happened. So, want to kind of differentiate those two things, um, but also with older investors or retirees, their willingness to use the platforms and the technology that do exist today that needs to be integrated more into the advisor systems. So that those, those on ramps that are being built into this you know new era of new asset classes and how to get them into brokerage accounts and the standard way of doing business that advisors can work on with their clients. Yeah, I love a Bitcoin spot ETF right now. What are we doing here? So th these are things that frustrate professionals, yeah. but are on the horizon that are definitely something you're going to see and be able to provide access to. You can have a 62 year old still working in their 401k plan access to a digital asset index. Yeah. And that, that it will be short order before you do see that. Yeah. Now, Mike, Michael, we talked a little bit about alternatives. You, you, had a, you were somewhere in the middle more um, in terms of uh, uh, not the stuff Doug is talking about, um, but you had, you had some views on, on some areas that, that might make sense. So I, <clears throat> I love the stuff Doug is talking about. I'm a geriatric millennial, and so I have <laughs> the time, wherewithal, and, and a little bit of money to speculate in those, in those arenas. But yes, definitely not, probably not for retirees, at least not, not at this point. Um, but there is demand from advisors and clients for alternative, invest in, alternative investments. Um, not, I guess maybe not so much hedge funds. I feel like they've had a, a rough decade and there's not so much desire for that sort of stock market, like beating absolute return type of investing. Uh, but there are platforms that cater to advisors that are doing phenomenally well, uh, leveraging technology and distribution to get advisors access to some of these investments that even advisors might not be too familiar with private credit and the way that these funds are structured and all sorts of things. So they're providing the platform, the, the access, the education. So places like uh, iCapital and Case, for example, like they're doing phenomenally well in terms of gathering assets. Now, in terms of like performance, I don't think that you could say that it's good, bad, or otherwise. It would be like, a, um, it is just such a broad brush that you're painted with because there are several different categories to say that alternatives are good or bad, like it's sort of, it's 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 too much to say one way or the other. Yeah, yeah. Um, Christine, Lozetta, do you want to weigh in on on these? What I like about um, the evolution of new asset classes is the access, right? So some of the conversations about being speculative, absolutely, because there's not a lot of history. Mm -hmm. What we're saying, not a lot of data. So when we're making these assessments that we have about the four percent rule, we have decades and decades um, of data to kind of support. Uh, what may happen in the future, because we know past performance is no guarantee yes. of future performance. And so I um, just like to hear from our clients about how they want to align their dollars and why they're interested in certain digital assets uh, versus others. And some say, I love real estate, but I never had the opportunity to really get a part of um, a private placement because I just wasn't in those circles and the like. So I'm with, well, I'm with Doug on having as an advisor, you, you have to be open. Uh, if you're really keeping your client's best interest first, you have to understand their why behind their investments, what they want to invest in, and does it align with their goals, their values, and obviously their risk tolerance and, and, and the like. So I don't want to generationalize types of investments per se, more of kind of anchoring in what's important to them and why and see if it aligns with um, the direction they're headed and wherever they are in life. Yeah. Um, can I just make one more point yeah, on, sure, on the, the, invest, the uh, alternative stuff? It's, it's sort of ironic because one of the reasons why people have seeked out these alternatives is particularly an alternative to the bond market, where investors have been very frustrated for the last decade, rightfully so. Like, it seems like uh, re reward-free risk. Like, what are we even doing here? You're, you're, you're parking my money, and it's getting, you know, 1.5% if we were lucky. And now... <laughs> 
actually, the bond market seems like a pretty decent alternative. Like the one-year treasury rate is giving you 4%. And you don't have to go like that far out onto the risk spectrum to actually get income that, yeah, fine, it's not keeping up with inflation today, but like assuming that inflation won't be 9% forever, you're getting, um, you're getting like decent Real returns return. on very, very plain vanilla stuff, which is exciting. It's been a long, long time. Like yeah. rates haven't been this high in, in, in my entire career. It's been yeah. a long time. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you, you made the point. So first, uh, you know, bond investors have earned nothing, and now they've lost 14%. Um, it, it is a natural, you know, is a natural question to say, well, what else is there? Um, so, Christina, I want to ask you this question. So, um, um, like Lizetta was saying, we don't have a track record a lot of these things, right? This, that's, and um, um, that's always a big question. Um, this, with retirees in mind in particular, where there isn't that long-term uh, time horizon, um, what are the questions, you know, as, as we're, if we're saying, okay, maybe this is a new rule, maybe this is a new rule that we can go a little further out on the, the alternative spectrum here. Um, how, how do you evaluate them if you don't have a track record? What are questions for investors to ask if they're considering something like you know, fractional investing in, in art or something like that? Well, if something doesn't have a track record, I think it's inherently speculative until we, we see some data on what sort of performance pattern we would expect to see with that asset. Um, and that's been my point on crypto specifically, has been here's an asset type where we do not have long-running historical data, certainly. But more importantly, we can't pin a value to it, that there isn't a way to affix a value to this asset, which automatically and uh, in perpetuity puts it in the speculative bin. And it's fine if clients come to advisors or if you're an individual investor who is looking at this asset type and saying, I think it's cheap now, or I think that there's great potential for this technology, fine, but do so as a speculative flyer. Uh, I thought that Michael's point on alternatives being a very broad basket was absolutely crucial, where we see very low risk alternative types and also things that fall under that umbrella that are incredibly high risk and incredibly speculative. So the key thing is to do your homework, know what you're owning and know why you're owning it and what you might expect to add or not add to your portfolio. I'll jump in there. And I, I think you bring up a good point. And, and I think it's very easy, especially with what we've experienced in the last two years regarding crypto specifically, to get hung up on that. Um, and it's just been the dominant narrative when we think of all. Um, yeah, I thought, I, thought it, I thought it went away. Um, but then you take uh, something like fine art, and I'm not pushing fine art on everyone here, um, where there is a very long track record you still could very much deal with you know, speculation depending on what kind of art you're looking at here. Certainly collectibles and art, large spreads between ask and bid here. Forensics are needed and all of that. But you can even have something in the middle here. Lots of history, maybe a lot of price action, but really does fit the bill of an alt. And if you compare it to the S&P, just in that specific asset class, compare it to the S&P 500, I guess you can select which artists you're putting into this basket. You probably kick the S&P 500's butt, right? And you can do that with fine leather goods as well, right? So I think it's very, I just wanted to point out, you know, we do have crypto on our minds. I know some of us are proponents of it, have enjoyed uh, learning from it. But uh, that breath that Michael is describing to, you know, kind of back up your claim, how broad this space is, you, you can get lost in any one particular segment of the alt's umbrella. Right, right. Liquidity is an important consideration too, right? Say, I mean. Yeah. Yeah. Talking about fine art, I would in inherently necessarily get concerned about liquidity, especially for people who are in getting close to decreasing. That, but that's what's interesting about the evolution with fractionalized investing is the creation of liquidity pools for um, addressing that very concern there. And, and Michael said it best: like maybe this isn't today, you know, and this isn't a conversation we're going to have with a retiree tomorrow. Like, hey, there's this great way to get you know a fractionalized Picasso, but. 10, 15 years from now, or 20 years from now, when our generation is knocking on the door, hopefully is retired by then, um, that should be fairly you know, pedestrian, I would think, at that point, to see you know, opportunities like that fitting inside a very traditional um, structure, you know, investment structures like brokerage accounts and things like that. But what's, what I find very fascinating, Doug, because you, 
earlier had commented about endowments, right, mm -hmm. and having a large percentage of alts. Right, we're talking about the 4% safe withdrawal rule, and then you compare that to endowments that right. have kind of the same spending rule, but they are designed to last forever in perpetuity, mm -hmm. generation after generation after generation. And so you have these clients who are thinking, wow, I want to do what the Yales are doing, and then they're not thinking about kind of the, the time horizon or the liquidity because they're not spending all this money. It, it's a different bucket sure. that to be thinking about a different time frame as well too. So I think it's important since we're talking to consumers alike to also um, value simplicity mm. um, as well to, to, to know that simplicity works and also to be aware of what's going on enough to say, Am I as sophisticated as some of these investment committees <laughs> are doing to make sure these asset class work in a way that aligns for me, my retirement, and then the legacy as I, I being the household deem important for generations that they're thinking about as well? 100%. Speaking of simplicity, a couple of asset types that I would say would be completely appropriate for retirees would be cash. And I've been a, a proponent of this bucket approach as an ongoing uh, strategy for decumulation. The basic idea is that you're holding a couple of years worth of portfolio withdrawals in cash. That would be your salvation in a year like 2022. So on the order of keeping things simple, cash, also annuities. Michael was talking about how interest rates have burnished the attractiveness of bonds. Well, same thing's been going on with the plain vanilla annuity types, where if retirees need to try to satisfy some sort of in-retirement cash flow need, look at Social Security, filing decisions, look at potentially an annuity, very basic vanilla annuity purchase as a way to augment cash flows apart from the income that you might draw from your portfolio. Right. So annuities might be something, I mean, that, that you know, they used to be fairly commonplace. Um, um, they, got kind of, they got a bad rap for a lot of good reasons. Um, and then interest rates went down to zero, which um, you know, made fixed annuities basically useless. Um, so it's almost like we've got a, a, an old rule that's coming back to be a, a, a new rule here um, at these kind of uh, interest rate levels. Yeah, on, on the annuity front, I thought it was very, very interesting to hear that word again after a long, long time. Like, what is she saying? <laughs> it's like, who wants, who wants this? Um, but to your point, with rates going back up and, and kind of innovation that existed after the last crash in 0809, those guaranteed withdrawal uh, benefit riders were actually amazing. But for a short period of time, those guaranteed benefit amounts relative to what bonds were offering was pretty much guaranteeing yourself a pretty nice bond. Um, and I saw that get gobbled up very quickly in the annuity space before rates went pretty much to zero. And it was all kinds of difficult, you know, fee layerings you had to deal with and explaining it to a client. They fell very much out of favor. Crazy to think. Crazy to think they're coming back. Oh, they're back. Can't, can't wait to pitch an annuity to a 38-year-old. It's going to be lit, let me tell you. No, all kidding aside, they're back in a viable solution at that as long as rates keep climbing north. I think they address two things that people love. One is guaranteed and the other is income. And so there's a huge behavioral component because advisors might look at the math and say, well, you could do better elsewhere. Okay, fine, maybe. Um, but, but investors love the idea of certainty. Yep. Whether, you know, they don't live in a spreadsheet. They live in the real world, and when the money comes in, and same reason why they like dividend stocks, even though they might you know, not be as good as another cousin of theirs, like whatever. People like their dividends. And people like the guarantees, and I think that's one of the reasons why you've seen such an explosion in success of the Buffett ETFs. I don't know if you all at Morningstar have covered those, but people love certainty, even if, again, mathematically, maybe there are, you're giving, you're, you know, you're giving up the upside, fine. That's the trade that they're willing to make in exchange to have like a floor on the downside. People love certainty, even if it's not like the absolute, uh, the, the optimal way to invest. I think but they really Michael, can you just that. explain them a little bit? I think yeah. a lot of people aren't familiar with them. So a buffered ETF, I guess, you know, bringing back to the idea of technology and and this being a thing that never could have existed inside of this wrapper uh, 15 years ago, is they use options inside of an ETF. And so there are all sorts of different dates and different uh, uh, caps and floors. And so you could say, um, I want, you know, whatever it is, 20% of the upside, and I only want to take 10% of the downside. There are all sorts of different ETFs that you can do to achieve these objectives. And yes, there are trade-offs. If you get, you know, you're not getting the dividend, for example. But my, the point is, 
that people love certainty. And once you, once you insert certainty into the stock market, which is inherently uncertain, yes, by definition, you are probably giving something up. But the, but the point is, people know what they're giving up. And they can see it black and white. I'm fine with the trade-offs. And so I think that those uh, buffered ETFs weren't even, I think they came around in 2018. And they went from zero to, I'm making it up, I don't know, $10 billion in assets pretty quickly. And I don't think see them slowing down anytime soon. They were notes before that. Right. right? Same the only exactly, way to get exactly. it, doing the same thing, but exactly. on notes with QSIPs. Yep. Now they're straight up over the counter. Yep. So that's something that's been you know, democratized, to use an overused word, basically. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is great stuff. These are, these are some uh, really interesting uh, uh, ideas for the conversation. I, I don't think I've ever heard the word lit and annuities in the same <laughs> sentence before. So, uh, it's 2022. Yeah, I, I have to catch up with, up with the times. Um, we're going to take uh, some questions in a couple minutes. Um, um, I do want to bring it back a little bit to, um, um, to the environment around us um, as well in terms of inflation and what, what's that meant and, uh, for investing in retirement and um, uh, Christine, this is something that you've also looked at, um, written about. Um, you know, this is a very difficult environment, especially you know if, if you are living on a fixed income in particular. Um, you know, what are some of the levers for investors when it comes to uh, withdraw withdrawal rates or or portfolios in a high inflation environment? Yeah, it's a, it's troubling for uh, people on fixed incomes, certainly lower income people, because we've been seeing inflation hit hard in the core areas, the non negotiables, food, gas, uh, rent. So uh, there are a few cohorts that have been hit particularly hard. A key starting point for thinking about inflation, thinking about how to hedge against inflation is to think about where you're getting your cash flows from. So the good news is if you're employed, you're probably being, being made at least partially whole through your employer. Uh, pay increases have been pretty solid for many workers. But for pe people who are in drawdown mode, they are probably getting Social Security. Pensions uh, in the public sector typically do receive a nice inflation adjustment. So for people who are getting their cash flows from a public pension or from Social Security, they're getting inflation adjustments there. The portion of their portfolios that they're withdrawing in retirement, though, so for people who are actively drawing on their, their portfolios, that isn't getting any sort of inflation adjustment. It's not getting any sort of inflation hedge unless you take steps to add it to your portfolio. So I bonds have been on fire. They've yeah. been generating another category that has been generating a lot of weird excitement in 2022. Yeah. I bonds, treasury inflation protected securities. I would look to kind of short term treasury inflation protected securities using a fund uh, like Vanguard's. I would think of them as assets that I would add to my portfolio to try to protect the purchasing power of my fixed rate investments, which are unfortunately really vulnerable in an inflationary environment. You guys have a so I have to share my, my bias as a financial planner. And why I say my bias is because a lot of our clients, whether they are the Gen Zers just getting going in their careers to the baby boomers retiring, is that we did some pivoting, right, in terms of refinancing when interest rates were low, building up the, the cash reserves, figuring out what goals they had to get in rhythm so that inflation didn't seem as much as a shock. It's been surprising that inflation has been low. Like you said, for most of our careers, we haven't seen double digits. So even thinking about five to 6% for what we've heard about the baby boomers saying, I remember when it was 10% <laughs> in the oil crisis in the 80s and the like. So we Gen Xers have the benefit of hearing and knowing that it could be double digits. Um, we also, as financial planners, have the, um, when you're talking about levers of things to just put in place in terms of foundational so you can pivot faster and people even changing jobs and not worried about things because they have the foundation in place. And then also just, just realizing if you need to buy a house, you know, because you haven't and interest rates are going up, you just need to buy a house and you just figure out how to make it work. And that's the key that you want to be wise. And you, you see that grocery bill saying, oh, my God, it's almost doubled. And you pivot and yeah. you figure out how to make it work. But the key is being able to take a step back and not getting so anxious about what you're hearing. Um, be wise about what you're seeing and making the adjustments that you need to make in your life. Yeah. Yeah. Great. All right. Let's see if we have any uh, questions from the audience or online. I do. 
I do have some from online. Does okay. anyone? No. Okay, we'll start with online then at least. From Kevin, regarding withdrawal rates, do you consider income from interest and dividends to be incremental to the 4% rule? Really good and important question that comes up a lot. So your 4% withdrawal or whatever sort of system you're using to guide your withdrawals, it includes your portfolio's income distributions as well as any uh, sort of capital that you might pull. So it's not like you're able to take 4% plus your 2 or 3% dividend yield. That's all in in terms of your withdrawal amount, your safe withdrawal amount. Okay, we have another one. Um, what about a SPIA for a retiree to cover fixed expenses? And perhaps share what that is in case people listening don't know what that is. Who wants that? So that is a single premium immediate annuity where you will hand over the insurance company a lump sum of money, and in exchange for that, they will pay you back interest as well as your money, which again, it's a behavioral thing, right? Like, even if math, people need the certainty because they cannot do it on their own. And when I say they, me too. Like everything that I do is automated for a reason because I cannot rely on myself to invest on the second of every month. Like I don't do it. I can't do it. I'm not, I can't trust myself. So I hand it over to the computers to do it. Same thing with this. You hand over your money to the insurance company for the promise of either uh, you could turn it on today. Is that what the immediate means? You get the, you get the income immediately. It's been a while since I worked in an insurance company. <laughs> the, 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 the unsexiest of annuities. Yeah. Right. One it's, issue, though, is inflation, that you're kind of a sitting duck with respect to inflation with a product like that, and that the inflation riders, to the extent that you can find them, yeah. are super costly yes. and often not a great idea. So that's a headwind uh, for annuity purchasers. They're locking in a lot of today. Exactly. Right. This is the type of thing, though, that um, uh, like like with any annuity, you can use that as sort of like a core. You you it's it's in addition to uh, social security. You know you're going to get this amount of money, and you can um, you can perhaps take your inflation protection elsewhere in your portfolio. I think that's right. I think that's a good way to look at it. Every annuity wholesaler is going to be down <laughs> downloading this this panel. Who'd have thought? Any other questions? We're good. Um, all right, we've only got a few more minutes uh, left in this in this panel. Um, um, I did want to talk a little bit about um, uh, uh, in, investing for your your, your kids, um, thinking about the legacy that you want to leave. Um, uh, Lizetta, you have some interesting thoughts about uh, how folks can uh, think about having money uh, to help their help their kids out as as they head through retirement and beyond. Yep, my my view really comes from those who are first generational wealth. Right. So you're thinking about if you're first gen and particularly could also be sandwich generation where you are a help building and protecting the generation ahead of you, your parents and the generation behind you. And that could be your children or nieces and nephews as well, too. And so I have a 17 year old daughter and I would always joke with my clients is that your children are not your retirement plan. Right. And what I mean by that is them one subsidizing you in terms of resources, money, but also time as well, too, because as we think about long-term care, it's like, who's going to care for us? One of the gifts that we can give, and I often tell our clients as well, too, in terms of investing is our children, creating their portfolio sooner. Oftentimes, we're thinking about 529 plans as an investment strategy, but also getting them the Roth IRA, so they're starting their retirement early, their brokerage account as well. And so I know there's trade-offs. We've talked a lot about trade-offs in terms of the dollars, and thinking about where you're building your wealth, also building it for the children when their dollars are working best for them. Because oftentimes we have missed out on some opportunities because time has passed us. And maybe children can be, in a very interesting way, um, your retirement plan because they won't need anything from you <laughs> because their dollars have been working for them you know, since day zero, which is uh, a way of thinking about retirement as well, too. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a great way to think about things. Anybody else on the panel want to add to that in terms of your conversations with folks? Well, it's like I tell my three-year-old about uh, his stock portfolio. No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> uh, yeah, I like for well, I do it for my children as well. Uh, I have uh, an automatic deposit that goes in every month, and when they get gifts for their birthday, it goes in that account. So I am a big proponent of starting them early and automating that. Um, I've been buying them annuities every week. <laughs> Figure, why not? Um, 
for for very, I, I love this one. I'll just share it. I have, we have young children, three three and six over here, and you know, I did this with my older one when she was three or younger. You know, it was daddy, mommy, why, why is one of you going on a train every morning? You know, what's that all about? And just to break down this idea that, you know, work and what we do allows for things you enjoy, right? Do you like going to the flea market on Saturday? Well, you know, mommy and daddy go to work so you can enjoy birthday parties and flea markets. <laughs> just getting the connotation, you know, just making the relationship. You know, these are the, these are my favorite things to talk about in this, in this particular question is just, how do you insert the building block to give them the construct to start thinking about money? There was, there was nothing complex about that thought. Just let them know, you know, work equals, you know, the, the use of your time to do what you want to do. If they can get that at an early age, you've set them up for a, a really good journey in terms of, money, you know, their relationship with money. Well, I, like, I like that we've bridged the generations here to, uh, to, to wrap out the session. Guys, thank you so much. This has been a, a wonderful conversation. And uh, look forward to the next panel. Thank Thanks, you. everybody. Thank you. Thank you.